I've been with the project since it was set up back in 2012. And I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, about commuting in Corvids. So we've learned so far that they've got very busy social lives during the day. And these social lives continue all the way into the evening as well. Um, so jackdaws are a bird which likes to roost communally in the winter. And they will travel quite a long way to do this as well. Um, that's the wrong direction. That's the right one. <laughs> and we're in a really good place to study it down here because it has been studied for quite a long time. So there's a man called Franklin Coombs, who from 1942 to 1952 studied uh, where the birds went to roost at night. So what we have here is a picture of the Ennis roost, which is just north of Penryn. Um, and that was the biggest roost, um, one of the biggest roosts in Cornwall at that point in time. He had up to 14,000 birds a night coming into that um, during the winter from November right the way through to February. Um, and this roost actually doesn't exist anymore, so the birds have left it. The trees are still there, but the birds have moved elsewhere. The big popular one that we have now is just up here, a little bit to the south of St. Day. And so that's where most of the birds from Stiftings go. Um, but all of these lines that you have on the graph, or the map, are all of the distances they could commute. So you've got the birds coming all the way from Baldu all the way down to Ennis every night. And we don't really know, well, we have, there's a number of reasons why birds might want to do this, and they might want to come together at night. Um, one thing is, oh, this is uh, just some of the birds on their commute. Um, one of the reasons that they might do this is to use the roost as an information center. And this is something that happens with ravens. Um, so ravens, when they go into a roost, they can see who's fed well, and they might then follow those individuals out to find the carcass that they fed on the day before. And they can then take advantage of that food resource. But what we've learned about jackdaws so far is that they, they're really into their partner, and they also really care about their home as well. And there's only a couple of months of the year that they're not going to go back to their nest site. And so for a lot of our birds, the first thing they do in the morning is they get up, they leave the roost, and then they fly all the way back to their nest, and they go to their nest just to make sure that no one gets any ideas about pinching it. <laughs> so there's very little opportunity for them to then take advantage of information as to who fed well where. Another thing that they could come together in the roost for is to avoid predators. If you're with lots of other individuals, you're probably less likely to get jumped on in the middle of the night by a polecat or something like that, or a pine martin, or even a tawny owl. Tawny owls are crazy, they'll take on just about anything. And magpies and jays do sometimes feature in the diet. Uh, but one of the problems with coming together in a big roost, as these starlings near Turin find out, is that you then attract predators as well. And that's a peregrine falcon diving down at the birds as they're coming into roost at night. And our jackdaws, this is them up near the roost uh, near St. Day, they do much the same kind of flying, the almost murmuration type flying that you can see in starlings. And so maybe the, when the young birds come together, the social bonds that they form are very important. Perhaps this type of flying is a way of assessing who's going to be a good partner. Who do you want to? pair up with this guy, oh, he can really fly well, <laughs> I think, I fancy him. But we just don't know, it really is a big mystery. And there are lots of mysteries that exist in the study of collective behaviour, and uh, that is how animals come together and how groups move. Um, so scientists have wondered for a great many hundreds of years how things like fish schools or starling flocks like this could operate. They thought that maybe there must be some telepathy that the animals had so that they knew which way their neighbours were going to go so they didn't have any collisions. And it was only in about the 1990s that mathematicians started to look at the theory behind it and they found that really complex behaviour like this could come about by individuals following some very simple rules. So the four rules of attraction, Repulsion and alignment. So you don't get too close to the one in front of you or the one behind you, and you try to point in roughly the same direction, and through doing that, you can do this, which is quite remarkable. And the earliest animal data that we got found that this held together and was quite true. And we now live in a very exciting age when technology has got to the point where we can go out into the field 
and we can start collecting information, collecting footage of these animals firsthand and see outside of a lab conditions actually how this behaviour works in the wild. And so that's what I've been doing eh, over the last couple of winters. I've been going out and I've been filming the jackdaws as they fly to their winter roosts. And we do that by taking these cameras that we have on the tripods here. We have four of them out in muddy fields and they're connected to uh, each They've connected to a laptop and these laptops are working well outside of their comfort zone uh, but they do manage to work most of the time um, and they're completely synchronized and so if I press the button every single one of these cameras starts collecting images in the same microsecond and they collect 60 images a second and we know that the image that we have on one camera relates exactly the same as the one that we've got on the other and so to make sure that everything adds up, we fly a drone like this up into the sky, we fly it in circles above the cameras, and then we have a reference point that allows us to understand every bit of space on the cameras across the entire array. And that means that when a bird flies through, like we have down here, we can track the entire journey of the bird through our camera array, and so this is 30 images a second, and you can even see the oscillations of the wing beats and you can count how many times the birds flap their wings per second. Amazingly, these birds, jackdaws, when they fly, they're flapping their wings four to six times a second. So we'll see that in action now. Um, this is footage from a roost near Mabe, and this is the birds coming down from the pre-roosting collection point to where they're going to spend the night. And to do this, we work with physicists from um, Stanford University in California. So you've got a group that comes in and turns and then turns again and these guys are experts in the field of tracking particles in space um, particles just like our birds they work in a field called fluid dynamics and so we send our data to Hangjin and Nick and they then turn it into like a 3d recreation so here we have the 3d up here so you can see the first bird's come through, and then you have this group comes, it turns, it realises it's going to get swamped by the ones coming behind, and they turn and they go out of the array. And so through studying these flights that we record of the birds, we can start to unpick the rules which are governing how animals are moving. So what makes the corvids so special? Well, to begin with, the... Uh, these models that they have of the early group movement, um, of the starlings and the fish, they make some pretty big assumptions about the animals that they're studying. They treat them all as being identical and interchangeable. So it doesn't matter who you're looking at, they're all following the same rules. Um, but from what we've seen with the jackdaws, it's actually probably going to be quite different. These are birds that are really, really closely tied to their partner. And as far as we can tell, they hardly ever leave their site. So if we visualize it in the starling model, what you would have is, sorry, in the starling model, you just have all of these birds that are all identical. But with our jackdaws, if we look at a group, we can then start to pick out, well, this one, that looks like a pair. We've got a yellow pair here, an orange pair, green pair, pink pair, and then perhaps three individuals there who aren't paired. And so, through looking at the data that we collect, we can start to ask questions. Um, in fact, before we do, we can just look at this video that I showed you earlier. And when you look at it now, there's a pair, there's a pair, there's a pair, there's a pair. You start looking at these birds flying, you can start to pick out the social relationships going on above you in the sky. And this actually draws some parallels to human society as well. So, I mean, it's a very rare animal, this, where we can actually pick out a substructure in the groups, just like we have with people at the train station. We've got a couple there, a couple there, but then we've also got individuals as well. So studying how these birds move through the sky above us can often help us to understand how human groups can move, and studying how these birds are going to move when they're panicked might help us to understand how humans might react when we're panicked as well. Because often when you have people, say, moving through a station, or at the stadium or something like that, you will be have individuals on their own, but there'll also be people who are with their families and with their friends. So we look at questions, simple questions, in the birds just now, um, such as what happens when they decide to turn left? 
but we can also look at other questions such as when a predator turns up like a peregrine or a pretend predator like we could create or something to scare them, how they respond when they're under attack. <coughs> and what have we found? So by studying the flight of these birds over our cameras, we found that where you fly in the group seems to have an energetic cost. So the denser the area of birds that you're in, if you've got more birds around you, the more you have to flap your wings to adjust because you don't want to collide with the ones about you. Also, it seems like the paired birds pay less attention to what's going on around them. So an unpaired bird, like this one here, follows rules very much like a starling does in the starling flock. They're making their decisions to align and not get too close or too far away from other birds based on seven or eight birds that are closest to them. When you think about the pair birds, when we look at the pair birds, they're focusing on less than half as many. So they're looking at their partner and they're looking at maybe one or two other birds. And this has implications for the energy cost for the birds as they're flying as well, because the birds that are flying in pairs flap their wings left off less often than the ones that are unpaired, because they don't seem to be making as many adjustments. And all of these, both of these, flap their wings more often than ones that are flying alone. And because these paired birds are paying less attention, it seems that information moves less well through the group. So if we have a group here where all the birds are unpaired, if one says they're turning left, yes, I got you, we're turning left, Roger, starting turn now, it moves through nice and efficiently. But when you bring in the paired birds, it doesn't go quite so well. Someone says, oh, we're turning left. Sure thing, we're going left. What now? Oh, oh, right left, yes, okay. Left it is. And also we found that there's no clear leaders in jackdaw flocks as well. So it isn't that the men wear the trousers and they make all the decisions, say, oh, bro, we're turning left. No, so the male, is, if he makes a turn, the female is just as likely to make a turn after him and then he adjusts to go where she's going. Um, and where you are in the flock doesn't seem to matter in the winter flocks either. So turns can actually be initiated by this pair at the back. They'll turn out and then everyone will come with them. And you can start to see how fluid some of the flights can be in jackdaws. If you look at this um, video that I took um, two winters ago up near the St. Day Roost. And this is what I call an assembly flight, when the birds are just flapping around on the breeze just before they head to their final roost at the end of the night. We don't know why they choose to do this. They don't just fly in and then just go and land in the trees and go to sleep. They tend to fly, they meet, come to this staging point, and then they just have a lovely little wheel around up in the sky most nights. And lastly, we found that the rules that the birds follow are not rigid. So in the winter, when the birds are flying to the roost, it doesn't matter where they are in the group, how dense the group is, uh, how many or how few birds there are, they seem to just go in a straight line for the most part and everyone's on the same page. But when we, in the summer, we can make the birds come over our cameras for a different region, um, instead of commuting, we come and bring them to mob. Uh, when they mob, this is uh, another form of collective behaviour that birds have, uh, where they'll come together to try and drive a predator out of an area. And we can encourage them to do this by giving presentations such as this with our friendly stuffed fox and the little robotic bird. Let's see if I can make a play. Can you look at the screen? And we own my victory. I just spent an hour and a half rebuilding the clock that had fallen apart. Um, but yes, so using this controller, uh, we can make it look like the fox has caught a bird in the field, and it dupes the birds, the local jackdaws, for about two or three minutes, and they come in, and they get themselves into a right old tiz, and they fly around, and they go, wah, wah, look at that. It's a great method for social learning, such as um, Josh has told you about. So if this was a brand new predator um, that had just arrived in the area, then everyone could learn that this is a dangerous animal without um, having first-hand experience.
Uh, but what we found with the mobbing flocks, and I had a video that sadly isn't going to work, um, which would have displayed it very nicely, is that unlike the transit to the roost in the winter, um, everyone's following different rules to begin with. So you just have birds arriving from everywhere and they're shooting through over and it's just an absolute mess in the sky. And as more birds come and more birds come, suddenly it hits this tipping point where order just comes out of the chaos. And instead of the birds just flying everywhere, they suddenly start moving as one in a beautiful group above the stimulus. Um, and so that's a really, really smart example of how maybe the rules that they follow aren't always the same. And there's even more complexity to these groups because jackdaws don't always go to bed alone. Uh, they do it quite often here. For some reason, the rooks and stythians, they don't like to go with the jackdaws. They say, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll follow you in a little bit, guys. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're on our way, we're on our way. And then once the jackdaws from stythians have gone up to the main roost there, the rooks here go and sleep at good lates. Um, <laughs> but elsewhere in the country, um, the jackdaws and rooks all travel together to the final roost. And so you have even more complexity in the flock because the birds, say this pair of jackdaws, instead of just, you know, being their own bird and following their own rules, they care about their partner right next to them, but how do they care about, well, how much do they care about the fact that that bird there is a rook and that one's a jackdaw? So, we've been doing, getting footage of mixed species flocks, and in this one there's rooks as well as jackdaws, the rooks are the ones that look slightly bigger. And we are going to be doing more work this winter to try and unpick the effect of having different species in the group as well. And to do this, we're working with computer scientists from Canada um, that are really good at teaching robots to do things and what have you. Uh, and at the moment, what they're doing is they're designing these computer-generated birds, which we're um, training to train the computers to make them like the footage which I send them. And that way, we should be able to use the computers to identify the different species in the films that I take without me having to go through and go through about 16,000 birds and saying, that's a jackdaw, that's a rook, and I'm really not sure about that one because it's large and it's quite small. Uh, because they're very subtle differences, which I hope to show you in this, about how they flap their wings. So jackdaws like to go right down, and it's like they pull a jumper over their head, and they go right down, and they pull a jumper, whereas rooks are far more row, 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 <laughs> like that. So we're working with the guys in Canada to look at that. Um, and we're also going to see what happens when we give the birds a fright. So if there's a bang when they fly over the cameras or something like that, how the group responds to danger. So I'll wrap up there with this particularly spectacular uh, bit of footage that I to Cambridge actually it was um, last winter. Uh, but if you'd like to know where you can go to see some of the spectacular flying of the birds, uh, please come up and talk to me after. I'll be more than happy to tell you where you can find roosts in the area. Thank you very much.